So last night when I was working on the talk, I decided to, to narrow the scope. My, my abstract was a little bit too uh, ambitious. Uh, and since it's uh, the, the February Fourier talks, I, I decided to uh, focus on a, a Fourier coefficient question. Um, and, and really, it's about, uh, it's about polynomials, uh, multivariable polynomials. So, uh, so in my notation, uh, D is the, is the open unit circle, and T is the, the boundary. When I put a bar over it, it's, of course, the closed circle. And um, so what's the situation? I'm, I'm given a polynomial in several variables, and here I write it out in, in terms of its coefficients. Uh, it, it doesn't always work. Uh, and uh, and I, I assume that uh, in, in the variable zi, it's of degree ni. So this uh, set lambda is this, uh, is this sort of multidimensional rectangle of, uh, of nodes. And, um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce this function 1 over p modulus squared, uh, which uh, is a nice function on the detours, and, uh, and, and I can compute its, its Fourier coefficients. And, uh, and the question is, what, what is exactly this relationship between the polynomial and, and the sequence of Fourier coefficients? And, uh, and of course, uh, the, the polynomial, they're, they're a finite number of parameters. So these, these Fourier coefficients, they, they must satisfy a lot of relations uh, between them. And, and what are they exactly? And, uh, and in, in applications, you, the, these are the numbers you estimate from your measurements, and, and you want to find the polynomial P. That's, that's the, uh, the interest in it. And uh, OK, so let's make a couple of simple observations. Uh, f, is, f is real valued, so the Fourier coefficient satisfy this symmetry property. And uh, f is positive, which means that uh, if, if I look at it as a multiplication operator on an appropriate L2 space, it gives me a positive definite operator. And that translates into this, uh, into this infinite uh, tuplets, multivariable tuplets matrix being positive definite. So that's um, some initial observations. And, um, and, and what, what is the relationship? Well, this, this relationship is, is easy to write down. Um, and it, it comes from the fact that if you, to, um, if you do the, the function f times p, that's 1 over p bar. And this, this function is analytic in uh, 1 over z. And so, so many, um, uh, many Fourier coefficients of that function are 0. And you, you can deduce this equation. That's, that's not terribly hard. So here, here we have a finite matrix consisting of uh, a bunch of these Fourier coefficients. And um, this equation says that the inverse, the first column, I can express into this, in, to these uh, polynomial equations, the, the coefficients of the polynomial. So if, if I have this matrix, it's, it's easy to, to derive the polynomial up to a phase. Uh, but, but of course, the phase gets lost when you when you take the modulus squared. OK, so, so what do you need to solve for the, for the coefficients of the polynomial? You, you need these coefficients of uh, these Fourier coefficients. In this set, you need to take tuples in lambda and, and take the differences of them. And uh, so what you end up with, what you end up with if I, if I draw this in, in two variables, so you have your nodes. And uh, let's, so lambda lives here. Then minus lambda lives there. 
But when you take lambda minus lambda, you get, you get this, this bigger square. Okay. So you, this is the, the set lambda minus lambda. And, uh, and of course, you have the symmetry. So you really only need half of these to, to build the matrix. But, um, but the polynomial has on, only this many parameters in it. And, uh, and so they're, they're, they're about, you need about 2 to the d minus 1 uh, a multiple more on this side than, than on that side. So there's a, a mismatch in, in the degrees of freedom, if you will, in the number of parameters. So, so these coefficients here, they satisfy additional they must satisfy additional equations because they really come from a lower dimensional variety. And, and the only time when there is a match is, is, is in one variable. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the classical case. It goes back about a century with people like Tuplitz and Karatea-Dui and Sega that uh, if, if, I'm given, if I'm given coefficients, complex numbers, indexed by 0 through n, and I want them to be the Fourier coefficients of, of a spectral density function of the type above, 1 over p modulus squared. All I need to uh, make sure is that this finite tuplets matrix is positive definite. And, uh, and then I, I can find the polynomial by just taking the inverse and, uh, and take the first column. And, uh, and Sego, he was interested in orthogonal polynomials. He showed that, that when you compute a polynomial this way, it won't have any roots inside the unit circle. So that's the classical case. And um, so the question is, what, what happens in, in higher, higher dimensions? So, um, so in two variables, you're... you're you're with this situation, so you're, you're given your coefficients in, in, let's say, in this, for nodes in this region. And by symmetry, you also know them in this region. But to build the matrix, you need, you need also the coefficients corresponding to those nodes. So, uh, so here's, here's a small example. That's what the matrix will look like. And uh, where, where, the, uh, where the indices are plus minus, those are the ones that you don't know. OK. But if you want to find the underlying polynomial, you, you want to take the inverse of this matrix and look at the first column. So you, you want to figure out what they are. And uh, so I, I worked with that um, with my co-author, Jeffrey Geronimo from Georgia Tech. And, uh, and, and, this, and this, is, this is the result we found. The, uh, so we, these are the, the indices for which we don't know these coefficients. And uh, what, what's the condition? Well, certainly this tuplets has to be positive definite. But there is an additional condition. Namely, that this, this rank of this submatrix, which is of size, uh, the submatrix is of size n times m plus 1 times m times m plus 1, that submatrix will have to have rank nm. So, so there, there are conditions on the Fourier coefficients uh, that relate them to one another, and, and that's the condition in two variables. So in, in this example, uh, so here I took n and m, uh, 1, 1. So we only have these four, con four coefficients are given. And then when we built the matrix, this x is unknown. x is the c1 minus 1. And uh, what this theorem says is that, that this submatrix here has to be of rank 1. And uh, so that determines uniquely what, what x should be. 
and then you and then you have to check whether what you get is positive definite and then you can go ahead and then you can find your polynomial okay so um, and and our proof our proof is um, basically what we do is we start with this scalar valued two variable problem and and we get rid of one of the variables and make it a one variable problem, but now things are matrix valued. But since it's one, one variable, we, there's still techniques that we can use, and so we get a result. Uh, but, but we don't know what to do when we start with three variables. We can do the reduction and we get a two variable problem, but then there, there are not the techniques to solve that. And, and this is still, uh, a big open problem for us. So, um, okay. So, so then, um, we, we, okay, we, we don't know quite how to do this, so we start looking at other questions. Um, like, you, you can ask, based, based on what you know about the polynomial, how fast should these Fourier coefficients decay? You know that they're going to decay because you have a, you have a nice Wiener function. It's, it's, uh, it has an absolutely uh, convergent uh, uh, Fourier expansion, so they, they certainly have to decay. But how fast are they going to decay? And, uh, and in one variable, it's, it's clear. You have your polynomials, so you can just factor it. You have your roots, and you can just express the Fourier coefficients in, uh, in terms of the roots. And, um, and uh, the rate, is com rate of convergence is determined by the root that's closest to the, to the unit circle. So that's, uh, okay. So what, what happens in two variables, uh, so this is also part of my paper with Geronimo, what, what, uh, what turns out to be of importance is um, we have this polynomial Two variable polynomial. And uh, we also look at the reverse polynomial, which is defined here. But another way of thinking about it is that you you reverse all the coefficients and you and you take the complex conjugates. So coefficients corresponding to high powers are now coefficients corresponding to low powers. And uh, we say that a pair ZW is called an intersecting zero if, uh, if it's a common root of, these, uh, of P and its reverse. And uh, so you have, uh, you have two equations with two unknowns. And uh, in this case, because, because of the stability, of, because there are no roots in the closed polydisc, it, it turns actually out to be a finite list of uh, of polynomials, so these, these two varieties, they only intersect in, in a finite number. And, um, and because the P doesn't have roots in the polydisc, uh, they, they must be of this form where one, one, one uh, uh, the, the Z is either inside or outside, but then the W is, is the opposite. So, uh, so we, and, and because of the symmetry, these roots also have this symmetry that if something is a root, then one over z bar is, is also a root. So we, we can organize these intersecting zeros in this way. There are two nm of them, and they have, they, they come in pairs like this, and uh, we, can, we can organize them in this way that the zi and the wi are inside the circle. Okay, so what, what we found in our paper is that if you look at the Fourier coefficients for this region, so this is, um, it's a region like this. You have, uh, it's a region like, like that. So the, the K can go up to infinity and the L can go to negative infinity. So you essentially get uh, 
the fourth quadrant, and by symmetry, you also get the second quadrant in this way. And, uh, and so these, these Fourier coefficients in those two quadrants, they depend on these, on these um, intersecting zeros in this way. So, so you can analyze the rate of convergence just by, by looking at those intersecting zeros. Okay. So, but uh, what was left open is, is what happens in the first quadrant. Um, we didn't know what to do, so that left open for a while. And uh, recently I got my student working on this. And, uh, and he figured out, and he used the results by Pimentel and Wilson to figure out what's going on in the first quadrant. So first of all, you have to, you have to decide on a direction. So you say, you, I want to know the decay rate of, the, um, of these Fourier coefficients in, in this direction. So I pick an RS. And then I and then I and then I go off in that ray, and uh, and so you fix your direction, and then you solve this system. It's again two two equations, so it turns out you get finitely many points here. And uh, here you and you do the same for the reverse problem. You get a finite number of points, and. Uh, and, and these pairs, along with the intersecting zeros, they determine the, the decay rate in that direction. But, but again, um, it's, it's hard to, to see what's going on in, in higher dimensions. First of all, you, you don't, when, when you take uh, the roots of P and P, P reverse, if it's three or more variables, that it won't come down to a finite number of, of roots. In general, you would have some variety. And, um, and again, I, I'm not sure how to proceed. Um, this, this technique by P. Mantel and Wilson can be uh, used in higher dimension. Uh, but, but still, I feel like the, the polynomial has this has this finite number of coefficients, and so really, uh, it, it should come down to some some finite uh, uh, problem where there where there are finitely many parameters to worry about, and and that's not clear. Okay, so we we keep running into this this problem. How do you go from two variables to three variables? So uh, I want to end with, with a problem where, where we do get, uh, oh, okay, I went back, sorry about that, where we, where we do get some results in, in, a, in a general number of variables, although it's, again, there's an issue when you go from two to three variables. And, and this is the following question. Um, if, if I, uh, these polynomials that are non-zero on the poly disk, how can I generate all of them? What, what's the parameterization? What's the description for all of these? And, uh, and here's one way you can, you can generate them. You can start with a, um, with a contraction matrix K, and you can take this, this matrix Z, and what, what does Z do? Z is just a diagonal matrix. And on the diagonal, you have your variables. So you have uh, a few Z, Z1s, and then a few Z2s, and so forth on your diagonal. There are N1 Z1s, N2 Z2s, and so forth. And uh, if, if the Z is strictly contractive and the K is contractive, then, of course, this product is strictly contractive, so this determinant is, is not going to be zero. And if you want to do it the other way, make Z contractive and K strictly contractive, you're in the same situation. And um, 
So, so these polynomials that satisfy this condition, you can certainly generate uh, a good number of them in this way. And the question, of course, is, is that it? Are, are these all of them? If I, if I start with a polynomial with this property, can I represent them in this way? OK. So of course, one variable is trivial. We take the roots. And uh, the k is just going to be uh, a diagonal of the reciprocal of the roots. And uh, so if all the roots are outside the unit circle, the k is going to be a contraction. And, uh, and so it, it's trivial. OK. Um, the two variable case turns out to be also uh, quite elegant. Um, and uh, so here, we start with a polynomial where in Z1 it's degree n1, Z2 it's degree n2, no roots in the by disk. And here, for simplicity, I just made the value at 0, 1. And it turns out it, it has this representation where k is a contraction. And uh, the, number, the number of times, oh, this should be a z1. z1 appears exactly n1 times on that diagonal. And z2 appears exactly n2 times on this diagonal. So it's, uh, it's the best you could hope for. And, uh, and, and this was done um, by Kumert in 1989. And uh, my co-authors and I, we, we sort of cleaned up the proof and understood it better. And uh, that was part of our, our joint paper. I have their names on the next slide, my co-authors. OK. So, um, so what, what happens in, in, in more than two variables? The situation is a, is a little bit more complicated. So with my co-authors. We, uh, we proved the following, that um, if, if P doesn't have roots on the closed D disk, on the closed poly disk, then um, we're, we're not sure we can represent this polynomial itself in this way. But w what we can prove is that it's going to be a factor of something like that. OK? And of course, if, uh, and, that's, and that gives you a certificate, right? If, if you can write p in this form, then of course, p will not have roots in this, in this closed D disk. So it, it does give you a certificate on, of this property, but uh, it's not as clean, it's not as clean as the, as the two variable result. And, um, and another part of it is that um, we, we don't know how big these matrices, how big we need to make these matrices. It's, uh, we, we have an existence result, but it, it doesn't give us bounds on how, how big the matrix is. So there could be a lot of redundant, redundancy in this, in this representation. And that's part of the problem why we get the Q. It's we it's it's uh, it, vol it involves uh, realization of of, uh, of rational matrix functions, and but we don't know in the multivariable case in this case how to make that realization minimal, so that 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 gives us this factor Q. Um, but anyway, there 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 is a positive result in in beyond two variables in this case. Um, we, this, uh, it, it actually generalizes to very general re domains. So here I just spoke about the, um, about the poly disk, but, uh, but you, can, you can look at uh, other domains. And uh, in general, those domains will look like uh, you have a linear pencil. Uh, 
you have a linear pencil and the condition your domain is described by um, by by this linear pencil being um, of norm one. So the poly disk you get by just taking taking uh, the linear pencil is just a diagonal matrix with these variables. Uh, but but our theory also works for domains like this, and then it and it includes like Cartan domains and and things like that. And uh, and and these are some of the references. And uh, that's where I'll stop. Thank you. <laughs>